First, I wanted to introduce myself. On premise is my life, 35 years between restaurants, being a supplier for 15 years, and then a distributor for the last nine years. So usually people might become a distributor and go to supplier. I like to say I do everything late and backwards. So I did supplierdom first, and so I bring those sort of sensibilities to the distributor side. And I never forget my years in restaurants. And one of the things I did in my long years in restaurants is I waited tables 10 years of my life. So people know that I never mess with their money, that I'm always going to hopefully leave them with a smile and give them the service that they're looking for. So we're going to have some fun today. This survey that I have in front of you, or your paper is down right here, is simply just for you. And one of the key questions is at the bottom, what do I want to get out of this workshop, specifically as it relates to me? My guarantee is that if I, I hope that I get to every question that you have, and if you don't, I'll give you my email and phone number, and I certainly welcome any and all questions. One of the things that I am also is born and raised in Oregon. The Graves family, my great-great-grandfather was actually the first nine legislators in the state of Oregon. It was before Shampooey, so we are, if nothing, rapscallions, because if you know, the people who settled this place weren't all nice people. So. Hopefully I've transformed through the ages. I, I know I have. So Oregon is near and dear to my heart. My first experience with Oregon wine, I was working for Roger Lextray, a Frenchman from Vichy, who opened the Brasserie Montmartre on Park Avenue back in the late 70s. And here he was passionate about his French <coughs> wines, but he had three Oregon wines on his list. And I asked him, what is it about, you know, besides the fact that we're here in Oregon, what do you love about Oregon wines? And he said, because it goes with my food. And I never forgot that. And he was the first one really to turn me on both to French wines and Oregon wines at the same time. Then later I was working for Horst Mager and I got to wait on the Sokols and the Blossers when the grandparents would come in and the, I was their server that they loved to wait. So a lot of, in my heart, is Oregon wine, so that's why I say, even though I work for Young's Market Company, if you have a question and you want to rap about something, please feel free to give me a call. So our theme here today is buy local, drink local. And I would love to have bumper stickers with that, with our Oregon, and we'll get into it in a minute. I don't want to sing my song. Okay, here we go. So here's our agenda. My introduction, the assessment, and if you can just, I'm going to give you about three minutes to fill that out right now, because if you don't, you're all too busy and you won't do it. So get started on your questionnaires, and you can pop up and look at the agenda after that. Can I do what? I'm sorry? OK. Oh, I see. OK. There should be enough. Brought 50. So if you're if there's more than one person from a winery, you could also share in case we're short.
Okay, I'll give you one more minute. Finish up. All right, let's get started. Helps to focus our minds just a little bit, and you can, if you didn't finish it, keep, you can peek every once in a while if what I'm saying isn't completely interesting and finish. So we have our assessment. We're gonna take a look at the uh, on-premise universe. What does it look like for the state of Oregon? And then we're gonna do some math, which, you know, someone, uh, Rick knows Jack Soul, one of his famous lines was, they told me there would be no math. Well, there will be today, a little bit. And then we're going to take a look at both our successes in the market and our challenges as wineries and for me as a wholesaler. And then we'll talk about some opportunities and tools. And some of you may already be aware of these tools. Today may just be the day that you think maybe I'll pay more attention to it. And that's the idea of having the questionnaire. Just You might be aware of many of these things, but today may be the day that you say, you know what? I've got a long to-do list, I've gotten a bunch of it done, I'm putting this back on. So today is just a day of, I think, looking at our opportunities and priorities. Uh, whoops, hold on, I wanted to finish. Okay, and then hospitality starts with you, and that will, lead, that will actually come back uh, from our discussion on market challenges, and then how to use the community better. And I'll give a couple shout outs to the Oregon Wine Board and how they're doing that. And then looking at awards and acknowledgement and wrap up. So, how, by the way, I can adjust my time accordingly. How much time do I have? 30 minutes, 20 minutes? 30 minutes. Okay. All right, what is our on-premise universe? If you look at the city of Portland, our fine dining is about 1,000 accounts. And that's being really generous. It's, it it's, might be around 900, but as we, no, just like with wineries, restaurants are opening up all the time, right? And then if we look at downstate fine dining, and that would be Eugene, uh, Medford, Bend, about 250. Central Coast, about 50. North Coast, 40. The Dow's around 25. Bars and taverns, we could go into the stratosphere on uh, numbers of accounts there, but generally their price point is such that it isn't friendly with an eight or nine dollar Pinot Gris, and definitely not with a 12 or 14 dollar Pinot Noir at the low end, much less the high end. So that's our universe. Now let's, this is the part where I told you we're gonna do, oh, first let's take a look at independent accounts and national accounts, because some larger wineries might even have someone that specifically calls on national accounts, and that would be, you know, the Chili's, the Roost Chris Steakhouse, the Mortons, uh, the RUIs, uh, Portland City Grill, McCormick's, that group, Landry's. So of our area here, Oregon is 75% independent. Does anybody know what the rest of the country generally runs? It's about 50-50 and sometimes it's actually about 60-40. And some cities, we've all been there, <laughs> it's 70-30. And then if we look further into the national account world, within that you've got 25% regional accounts. We have places like McGrath's here in Oregon that to get an Oregon wine feature could really generate some great cases for you. So it's important to know that there are plenty of regional accounts where your wines can fit. Yeah. Yes? That would be our system, which is, uh, we have the number one national account person in Oregon, Russ Rosalette, who precedes me by a good 12 years. <laughs> All right, so let's do the math. So if we look at the average wine list, there's about 80 to 100 wines on that list. Then of the list, while there are some, thank God, that are like 80 or 100% Oregon wines, a lot of them, it runs at an average of about 20 to 30%. So then you look at then the number of wines per list, and we're looking at 16 to 33 wines on that list, could be an Oregon wine. Then we take our viable accounts, which was on the previous slide, which is about 1,365 accounts. 
we take the range of the total number of wines, and that should actually say Oregon wines, because it's not all of their wines, in an account universe. So if we do the math, and again, I wasn't great at calc or anything like that, but general math, I was pretty good. So it could be the range of anywhere from 21,000 to 45,000 possible Oregon wines on a list in a given snapshot, right? Now, if you look at 500 plus wineries, that's 44 to 90 pods. And as you're dealing with your distributors, this is one of our terms, points of distribution. And one of our reps or DMs likes to call it points of distinction because he'd like it to last longer than just a drop. So if it's distinct, if it's a distinction, it'll last longer. And then we, so then take it among the, let's say the top 100 wines because some wineries make enough just to sell to their friends. Some wineries do wine clubs, some do direct to consumer through email, et cetera. So let's just even look at the top 100 wines. So we're looking at 218 to 450 points of distribution per winery. So as you're thinking about what can I expect from on-premise, this is just a given snapshot in a given day. Now, what do restaurants do? Do they change their wine list daily, weekly, monthly? Some of them do change them daily. If they have an in-house printer, if you've ever been to Blue Hour, it could change from lunch to dinner. So I say I did this exercise because sometimes people have an idea of what they can expect from a wholesaler, expect from the market. It's important to know that both what, is the, what are the possibilities, what's the range, and then also knowing when and how often restaurants change. Here's a little program that we are doing. This We're in our second year with Young's called Pinot Passion. Because one of the things that I noticed in our business was we excelled in Pinot Gris and we had an opportunity gap with Pinot Noir. Yet with all of our Oregon wineries, what do I know is their thumbprint is, you know, it's Pinot Noir. So we made it really, really advantageous for our people to make sure there's a Pinot Noir in their bag every day. So we call it Pinot Passion. So far uh, this year, we're up 19% in points of distribution and 13.4% in cases. Now, some wineries are up much higher, some wineries are flat, but overall, that is the number. So what are some of the tools that we use? Well, uh, one of the key tools is features for restaurants. You know, we use Oregon Wine Month, for instance, to salute the French. We have a lot of French winemakers, so we kind of threw a little marketing twist there. We have live certified all the wineries that we have in our book to create wine flights, to create features, but to get people's attention. Because so many times, I think Rick said it, there's white noise out there for our sales reps. There's white noise for restaurateurs. They've got a refrigerator that just broke down, their cocktail waitress called in sick, and they got to pay for the wine that's coming in the door with the money they made the night before. They got a lot on their plate. So how do we get their attention? How do we make their job easy? Right here, I've got this turnkey PDF that you I can print up for you and have on your uh, tables. How many tables do you have? Thirty-five tables. Good. We've got. Well, we can get that back to you, and by the end of the week, I can come in and do a staff seminar, etc. The other thing that I've done for my team, which has turned out to be a great tool for our retail people too, is I took all of the wineries that we have in a map of Oregon, and we're selling by appellation. Seems really obvious to you guys, but when you're in a giant distributor, you have to keep creating tools to get it very, very uh, you know, clear and simple. So I have copies of this, by the way, so you guys, can, if anyone is interested, you can take it with you. Another one, which I'm very proud of because I'm seeing it more and more, is uh, we did a G2, so generation two. We've got several wineries that have the second generation of of kids taking over, and that's a great way. So what we have to do, and what we have to bring, is more ideas and more marketing ideas to our restaurant tours. So what are our, some of our challenges? And for some of you, you know these only too well. See, I have that hill there. It's like climbing up a hill sometimes. All right. Uh, buyers can be prima donnas, right? Some of them. You know, what's in it for me? Why should I pick your wine? Um, Oregon laws can restrict some of the programs that we have. 
maybe sometimes, oops, did I do that? Uh, you know, with pricing, we don't have quantity discounts here, but it, it is a clean market. I've lived in California and sold with the quality discounts. I actually like the cleanness of this. It's a good wine at a great price, and here's the story that goes with it. So we'll, we'll all learn some new skills when we get to that quality discount place. And then just looking at programs, like I just discussed. A program that you come to the restaurateur or you're riding along with your distributor or however you are going to market, but coming to them with a program that makes it easy for them to do their business and easy to make the decision to buy your wine. <clears throat> Oregon pricing is tricky and I really have a heart for where everyone is. It's like you want more volume, right? We all want more volume, but we don't want to give up a really hard-earned price point and luxury price point that really, across the country, the surveys that have been done, right, show that people view Oregon as luxury. So that's a tricky uh, challenge that's before you. I certainly cannot make that distinction, but I do know, having worked back in my history as a, a supplier for Jess Jackson, who used to play with pricing all the time and play with elasticity, the market doesn't always like to go where you like to play, and we, we don't want to lose that, that place that we have that's so valuable. All right, themed eateries. We have a lot of Italian restaurants in Portland, and some of them only want Italian wines. I want you to know, not me, but I'm sure there's other uh, people in this room that are trying to overcome that. Asian, Mexican, uh, we, we mostly ignore our Latino restaurants, but if we think of the future and where we can get volume, that is certainly one of them. We have a cultural affinity in Oregon for other places and other, other lands, goods from other lands. We all fight it, but Oregon has one third of our wine lists in Oregon, one third of the volume is imports. One third. One third is imports, one third is Northwest, and one third is California. So that is a challenge. And then investment spending. It can be costly to you. Believe you me, I know. And, and even you know, when you're on a smaller scale to do the kind of investment that, well, so-and-so is doing this, or they put me up over here overnight, or you know, there's a lot of things that get discussed out in the marketplace between buyers. And to investment spend in account, only to have the buyer move on, can be tough. Do you like my little bouncing there? All right. All right, and then that, that is that change in buyer. So here you've made a big investment, right? And then that buyer leaves. And maybe they go to another restaurant, which would be good, because they'll probably still support you. But sometimes they might leave and go out of state or, or uh, to another industry. So. And then lack of loyalty in the home market. You know, we all remember this article in the Wine Spectator last year. And uh, I, I use it a lot when I'm talking to some of the Psalms, where you just say, you know, if you're in Napa and you open a restaurant, although Chez Panisse did it back in... Uh, 90, 90, and they had to change. They opened with an all French list in Napa on Highway 29, and they had to change because it doesn't work. When you're in wine country, you need to reflect what those wineries are. So we're up against some of this in, in the city. And one of my favorites is, you know, if you're really into esoteric wines, Portland is amazing. Consumers here are very open-minded, particularly if the price is reasonable. And then the line at the bottom, they're not interested in doing anything mainstream at all. So that gives you some information right there in how to talk to Psalms. Don't bring them your you know, largest driver wine. Bring them something that's really interesting. Make it seem like no one's going to get it but them or, or just a limited amount of people. They're not interested in the mainstream. So if you think of Psalms, they have worked hard to get their um, usually if they are a credentialed psalm, and there's a difference between a credentialed psalm and a person that calls themselves a sommelier, but they've worked hard if they're a credentialed sommelier. So what they believe and what they see around them is that if they write a wine list, that that now is their reputation. So as you're selling your wines or you're, you're, you're educating your distributor to 
represent your wines, it's really important to have a very clear story that talks to the specialness, the rarity, and why they should buy your wine that is the opposite of mainstream. It's got to be cool. It's got to be hip. It's got to be wonderful. So think about that. All right, what are some opportunities and tools? Buy the glass pricing. Now, you're saying, Sarah, you're talking out of two sides of your mouth. There's no such thing as buy the glass pricing. Well, that's really true. But you can create a price that is a uh, on-premise only price. And what you would have to, does every, do people already know this? Am I just being the wire? No? That's OK. So there is uh, an OLCC law that um, if you have a, for instance, let's say if you're going to move from your 2010 to your 2011 vintage and you have some of the 2010 left at your distributor, you can go ahead and release the 2011 to, your, to the broad market. You have to take your 2010 and put, you have to specially uh, sticker it so that it says on-premise only, or it says usually what people do is they'll put a VS, right? Or a, um, yeah, it's usually called VS. So you make a little sticker, and then that has a separate um, place in the warehouse, and then that goes out to the on-premise world. And you can check with your OLCC agent. I'm not, uh, I would never leave, lead you down the uh, straight. We do it all the time, and it's very successful because then that way you can get some of your wines that wouldn't normally be able to be on uh, by the glass, you know, in that sort of $12 sweet spot. Sometimes buyers will go to that $14 or $15, but really it, $12 is, is a lot of times uh, what they're looking for. So you can do that. You wouldn't do it with hundreds of cases, but you could do it with dozens of cases, and that way make some new friends. Um, <clears throat> so the other thought that I had while I was preparing this is, and I, I would say some of the most successful wineries do this, but if you have a wine that people could just get in Oregon so that the buyers knew that you weren't sending it to New York or Texas or LA, that it was, you had something that you made that was just for the Oregon market, because if you think about it, Travel Oregon is working so diligently right now to, I mean, we've had the busiest season in Portland in my entire life. It's been very hard to even get through because the traffic is so heavy. And it's because we're getting this food and wine tourism. And hotels are constantly booked. I don't know if you've had people come into town, but it's almost impossible to get a hotel anymore. We're really, our tourism is really kicking it up. So those tourists come to Portland they look at a wine list, and they see something they already have in Texas or New York or wherever. So think of it as a community. If we could do some wines that are unique to our market that makes it not only great experience, but hey, I'm going to come back because you know, I, can, I do, do my fun wine foraging thing. Uh, and then library wines. We have a winery, uh, Erath, and it's very wide dis widely distributed. And one of the things that's really helped is we've been able to get some older vintages that our tourists, our locals that are wine fans, will get to try some older vintages. So if you can, and I know sometimes it, it has to do with uh, cash flow, but to save those library wines and then release them to a restaurant, it can really help with your uh, image your profile, and then also that relationship that really cements the relationship with the sommelier. And then, you know, be encouraging when you see one of your neighbors, one of your wine neighbors on a list. It can be very frustrating because I understand your wine is your heart and you go in and somebody else is there. But, you know, don't be daunted. You could say, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so's neighbors. We're great friends. Why don't you do a flight? He and I can come in or she and I can come in. We'll do a staff lineup on Friday night. And boom, now all of a sudden, you've shown them that you're not, you know, uh, jealous or upset. You've just created a solution for them that not only is a solution, but is a way for them to train their staff and have something fun on the wine list, your feature. And then appellations. I, I showed you that little sheet. We have a force of 25 salespeople around Oregon. And for them to really start selling 
diligently on the Appalachian front. And the smaller distributors that have you know, fewer brands have been doing this for a long time. But uh, it's hard to get the kind of wine geekdom I want sometimes in, the, in our distributorship. We're getting there. But selling by Appalachian. So when you go and look at a wine list and you're surveying that wine list, and now with iPhones, by the way, isn't it great? You don't have to steal the wine list or ask for a wine list. I just take photos and then go home and start you know, digging into it and seeing what's happening. And, and what are the opportunities? So when you look at the Appalachians, look for the opportunities. Jot that down. Email that to your distributor. Say, hey, I left my card at Nick's the other night. I noticed they don't have any Shahala Mountain. Uh, maybe they forgot it this round or something like that. So just to help your distributor or for yourself as you're thinking and you're strategizing, looking at a wine list, you're looking for opportunity gaps. So one of the ways is Appalachians. The other is cost. You look at if they have a wine at, let's say, $36, and their next wine available is $52, well, they've missed a couple price points in there. You might have a wine that's perfect. Not you. Not you, but somebody might. <laughs> anyway, so to look for, and I was using lower price, but let's say between 70 and 95, boom, you, there's a gap. Between 95 and 120, boom, there's a gap. So look for those gaps anywhere between five to seven, eight dollars. That's a gap on the wine list. And especially if they have a good Pinot Noir section, then you want to make sure that you have the wine for that gap. And that's, an, that's a way. You're always looking for what's the way I can talk to this buyer. What's the way I can get their attention? To come to them with what you've seen in a friendly way and then to make sure that you give them a solution. And then education of the restaurant staffs. I will tell you, and I know that a lot of you in here already do this, but you will, you will do an education seminar. And <laughs> 10 years down the road, that waiter is now a buyer. It could be five years, it could be two years, but they don't forget you. They didn't forget if you come in and do a really great seminar, teach them about wine, teach them about the soil, the clones, whatever, they'll remember you, and the next time they see you, they could be the buyer, and they'll say, oh, I don't have your wine on the list, and boom, it happens, and it happens all the time. It's a relationship business. What Rick said is that people buy wine from people, and people also buy wine, especially in this state, with people they like. It's very interesting. I met this guy from New York once, a big, broad-shouldered dude, and he goes, hey, we don't care. We don't care if people don't like us. He goes, we buy, we, you know, and he used way more. Uh, he used a lot of expletives. But in other words, I could hate your guts, but if you've got a good wine, I'll buy it from you. That is not true in Oregon. People are very much, they like to buy from people they like to do business with. And it's a different dynamic that we have. All right, so one of the things that I encourage wineries to do is use visuals. If you think about it, everywhere we go in America, <laughs> today. Even, you know, McDonald's started this about eight years ago. They, they have televisions. You go to the airport. Everybody is visual. These, you know, everyone's on their phones. They can go and get information. So just really overdo it on the visualization. Your maps, your vineyard maps, your vineyard shots. Whenever you do a price sheet, don't do black and white. Have a shot of your vineyard. Have a map of Oregon with maybe a star or a focus on where your winery is. In other words, Always think like what you like. When you're looking at your iPhone, what do you, you know, your, your um, what's the other one? Um, anyway, smartphones. When you're looking at your smartphones, you like color, you like visual. Well, that's what somebody wants when they're buying wine. So if all of a sudden their eye goes to that vineyard, you're telling the story, all of a sudden you just created a magic moment for them and they're going to buy your wine. So just think of that. The other thing that I see a lot, I see it with my own company and I see it with wineries, is we give a lot of information, but we don't check <clears throat> if they learned what we gave them. So I always, I started this when I was a restaurant manager doing quizzes and then as a supplier. Do a little quick quiz. Maybe it's five questions and you have a prize. Maybe you have a wine opener or a bottle of wine, something. But in other words, make sure that they're listening. Tell them at the beginning you're going to give them a quiz. 
And then at the end, when you hand that out, you will be amazed how many people listen. They listen differently when they know you're going to ask them questions at the end. So I, I give that to you because you, it will not fail you. And the other thing that you give them is you actually force them not to think about what they're going to buy for groceries or what they're having for dinner or what friend they're meeting. You change their brain patterns by saying, this is what we're going to do, and this is what I'm going to do for you. And then they'll pay attention. It's so awesome. All right. That's our opportunity. Yeah. I just gave you the prize. You use that, and you'll, it, it'll, it'll serve you well. All right. Hospitality. One of the things that I listen to a lot with... Um, wineries is sometimes the frustration of um, <clears throat> going to a different restaurant and maybe nobody even comes by the table to say hello or you know there's usually a list of about three or four things that sometimes can happen in a Portland restaurant. So <clears throat> when you have wine, uh, when you have restaurants come down to the winery my challenge is let's outdo these guys with our hospitality, right? Let's show them what really fantastic hospitality is. And to make sure that you're communicating 360, what does 360 mean in my mind? It means that you have communicated to, if, if it came through a sales rep, that you make sure and you get the account information. So you've got their email, phone number, all of that. You send out the confirmation to the uh, distributor, to the restaurant, and then afterwards, the thank you. Here's what your group liked. I'm very excited. It seemed like you really liked our Pinot Gris. I hope you can work this into your wine program as soon as possible, something like that. But a 360. And then also, if you get feedback on the winery and maybe someone from the restaurant didn't have a great experience, I mean, I've had, I've had examples just in this summer, and I know it's been your probably busiest summer ever, but several people have gone to wineries and they had forgotten they were coming, didn't have anything set up. It kind of, you know, uh, it, it ended up being kind of a negative instead of what could have been an unbelievable positive. So to just know that if feedback comes, don't take it personally. Just think, hey, it's an opportunity. You turn it around, and the next time that person comes, it's all going to work out. I think that if you have top flight service at your winery, that just goes a long way uh, in the restaurant world. I had a brand new winery to us, and I said, um, can you send a PDF with directions? And their comment to me was, oh, they can get that on, online. So I took a deep breath. I didn't send the email I was going to send, and I said, uh, my suggestion for the future is that you have an auto-send or you have a way that you can just click and send me a PDF. I'll be happy to send it to the restaurateur. But in other words, if we just think in terms of it seems obvious, right? Just go down and turn right. But it, it, it is a way of branding yourself. So let's say the, the visit is a month out or three weeks out. They have your winery map on their employee bulletin board with your logo, maybe even a vineyard shot, for a month. And all of the people back there, they're seeing that. They're looking forward to it. So it's all about branding. It isn't about a PDF with directions. <laughs> it's about branding. So brand yourself, everything you do. Have your logo. Have those um, pieces. All right. Now, at the restaurant, when you go out to eat, these are my suggestions, and again, from each one of the tiers of life that I have lived. And <clears throat> it can be very frustrating when you've put your lifeblood into a winery and you go to a restaurant for the sixth time and they still do not have your wine on the list. Now, I wouldn't suggest going there six times if they don't have your wine on the list, but let's say you really like the food, right? Use your distributor for your muscle. Do, you do not want to be the muscle. Just tell me. You, I, I'm telling you, you do not want to be the muscle. Use your distributor, or if you have someone in your organization, you have a, a street rep or somebody, you can let them. But if you are the face of the winery, don't be the muscle. I'll give you a perfect example, and it won't be an Oregon example. Years ago, I was running a restaurant in San Francisco, and Robert Mondavi came in. And when he came in, first of all, it was a gorgeous restaurant. It was a Pat Coletto designed restaurant. He came walking in the door, and it was like a statesman. It was like a diplomat walked in. 
And he was, this was in 1991, so I can't remember how old he would be, but he was, he was definitely deep 70s or mid-70s. Walked in and we got him you know, to the best booth and everything. Now, mind you, I had a 200 item wine list. Only one winery had two wines and that was Robert Mondavi. <clears throat> so as I went over to greet him, he, um, <laughs> he was very strong, I'm very tall. He literally pulled my calf or my, my arm and pulled me down like this and whispered in my ear, Chardonnay, the Napa Chardonnay, you've got to put it on your list. So I'm the buyer, right? I'm the, actually, I was the general manager and buyer. So I went back to my office. I called my southern rep, and I, I just literally read her the riot act. Here is the godfather of the wine industry. I'm a buyer. That's the kind of ego, and I, I'll tell you, that they can have. And I said, I'm, I'm going to take both of them off. And she talked me down from the mountain. I didn't take them both off. But I say that to say, don't be the heavy. Let your distributor person be the heavy and get you the distri distribution that you desire. Because what you want to be is the face of the winery that is you know, wonderful and that people look forward to seeing you. That's why I had that one question on the questionnaire. When you leave a restaurant, what do people think? Do they think, wow, we just love that guy? Or whenever he comes in, you know, it's fun, or this or that. Or do they think, oh my god, they're the worst tippers. Thank god they're out of here. All they do is complain. We don't have their wine on the list. You know, what is, it, what is it that you are leaving? Because you have to think about it. Just like with that person that you did the staff lineup with, that same busser, waiter, whatever, that becomes a buyer will remember that too. So you want it to be positive. You want it to be just a positive uh, interaction. And then you know, find out things about the buyer. What's, do they have a charity? Um, you know, what is their family like? A lot of my reps will um, keep notes. What I do with my iPhone is I go down to notes and I just put you know, two children, two boys, put their names, their ages, whatever, so that I, I can't possibly remember. I would love to. I did back in the day, but I'm out of RAM up here. So I just save it, and then before I go to the restaurant, I make sure and I check my notes so that I am interacting with that person with what's important to them. They've got two boys in soccer, or I know that somebody's got to be near graduation from high school, you know, it's just a way of connecting with people, and it really, it, it's just a way of building your uh, reputation with them. Have they attended uh, Oregon Pinot Camp? Do you think that they should? Make a note of it, because always when Pinot Camp comes up, it's kind of a mad rush to figure out who, who should go. Um, <clears throat> and then, as I said on that last one, lead in gratuities. If, if you know that, um, you know, that goes all around the restaurant, in the back of the restaurant. They talk about how much you leave. I'll give you another California example. Uh, Duckhorn, uh, at the time, came into our restaurant. We were uh, big Duckhorn fans. We had a lot of Duckhorn on the list. They had a party of eight. They were a little tipsy, and the server told me that, God, they already signed their check. They didn't leave any money. Blah, blah, blah. So I went over. I knew them, and I kind of whispered in the ear, how was everything? Did everything go OK? Oh, fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Story to say, they left without tipping. I, I could not give Duckhorn away. We had to take it off of our list. And that is a powerhouse in California. So if you understand that your servers determine a lot, and so all, it's easy to get locked in with the buyer, but always make sure that you talk to the server. When uh, servers come to our table, they, they tease me at, at the distributorship. I will always ask them what their name is. And my, uh, one of our presidents said to me once, he goes, why do you ask what their name is? I said, first of all, I care about their name and who they are. But secondly, when a, a restaurant gets busy and you want, and you're inter let's say you're entertaining a distributor, or you're just uh, entertaining someone from your winery for a dinner, how do you get their attention? If you say, hey, you, or hey, oh, oh. But if you say, hey, Carol, boom, they notice and they come right to you. And it's also a way for me of just keeping that brain power going. I might remember it. So I leave that little adage at the bottom, which is on my uh, bulletin board at work, be the change you wish to see in the world. So many times I can get frustrated with phone calls or emails or things from different 
suppliers or this or that, but I'll tell you what, if I just change my attitude, then they'll change. I believe that as a state, we can change the representation of Oregon wine lists on our restaurants. And I would love to see, like, just, I don't know, just all over the place, 50%. I, th I don't think it's impossible. So I think that if we start thinking more about how can we do it, I think it's an ongoing conversation. But I think that we are proud of what we do and we, we want it in the restaurant world. So those are some of my suggestions. All right, so here's a couple of ideas. One of them is already in place, but the first one, think tank with psalms. I know that when I was in San Francisco, we had, it was when the Court of Master Sommeliers was first taking off. And one of the ways that even at Kendall Jackson, which the Vintners Reserve Chardonnay, probably one of the most widely distributed wines, we still had psalms that we would bring up to Santa Rosa or to Napa, and we would do a round table. We'd make it, you know, we'd cater the lunch by a really nice uh, caterer and have them taste some blends and help us decide what, what direction should we go? What do you think you, we should do? And they felt part of the process. And we were able to really get a lot more business in San Francisco by helping them make the process. I know you can't do this all the time, but even if a few of you collaborated together, and I know that some, some of the wineries already do some of this, but I think that it would really be a great way to get this stone uphill. And then our annual awards. I love what uh, we have here as far as, I hope you've uh, nominated your, you know, what are the three? Superior Cellar, Restaurant of the Year, and Psalm of the Year. Right, Tom? Where's Tom back there? Yep. So, yep. But I think that one of the things, too, that Washington did really well, and I used to call in Washington when I was a supplier, and I had a friend who won one of the awards. But they would not just do, uh, they would do an actual awards, like, like an Oscar kind of thing. And they gave out awards to restaurants. And they gave it out for the best list, uh, perhaps the you know, most interesting food and wine pairing, all different tiers, probably six or seven awards. But then you know, there would be like, let's say, a Portland restaurant of the year for Oregon wine. Are you laughing at me over there? No, you are. Yeah, do you think I'm full of shit? No, all right. I'm just telling you, no, I'm just telling you that it worked. Washington is ahead of us because they got their restaurateurs on their side, and you look at a lot of the wine lists when you're up in Seattle. There, there is a good preponderance, and it's not all Chateau Saint-Michel. It's a lot of Washington wine. So I know that these things cost money, but I also know as a distributor that if somebody tapped us, like Tom, on the shoulder and said, hey, would you be willing to kick in this much money and Galaxy and everybody else to really move this thing forward, I think we could spread the expense out and make it something really memorable. And I think we would have to do it from a place of we're not doing this for the short term, we're doing this for the long haul, right? Not just doing it once, to really make it a tradition. So just an idea, and you know, if you don't have ideas, it doesn't go anywhere. All right, takeaways. What did you, what are your questions that you haven't had answered? Uh, and if I don't know the answer, I'll certainly direct you to somewhere that you can go. So what are some of the conundrums when you're out there and you're in a restaurant or you're with your distributor and you're trying to decide what is an appropriate amount of distribution for my wine? What are some of the sticky points that you get to? Because on-premise isn't as easy as off-premise. Off-premise, you have scan data, you have IRI, you've got Nielsen's, you have a lot of ways of corralling information. Restaurants are a lot more challenging. Huh. Oh, good, yes. So Uh, other than doing a presentation of the state.
staff is kind of hard because they have been different hours. Mm -hmm. uh, how can you move your product in a restaurant like that? Well, one of the things that I would suggest is to, to make it a priority to get there, or if you can't, most waiters have iPhones. Make a little video and send it to the buyer. Or, you know, take, take some pictures of your vineyard and have the bottle of wine. Pour I mean, I don't know, but if you can't be there, I would say get, you have to get a message to them. Because like you say, when you have so many wines on a list, if you can't get their attention, there are other people that will get their attention because they'll be in there, right? So try something. The other thought would be, you know, even just um, doing a contest, you know, uh, seeing who sells the most, something like that. And to use their name, uh, this is where my wife works on the list without their permission. And you put on your lid insurance, brochures, anything like that. Well, I would, I, I don't, I, I would ask their permission. I wouldn't do it without their permission. Are you doing your literature um, that you're giving to consumers or to your distributor? Or, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. But if I run it down, I'm going to find my uh, wife at this particular restaurant. Uh -huh. Sometimes I ask Fred and Wire, and they don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. Uh, they, I think uh, you have to be careful, especially uh, with retail. I know um, if, if you ask them, a lot of people will say yes because they would love the cross marketing. When we did Oregon Wine Month, Tom put the restaurants that we placed different wines in, he put it on the website so people could go and frequent those restaurants. So I would just, I, I think people would probably welcome the extra publicity and, and the referrals. That'd be great. And just say to the restaurant, hey, I'd love to refer my customers to your restaurant. Do you mind if I, you know, put it on my, you know, sales sheet? I think they'd love the referrals. Yeah. I don't know too many restaurateurs that you know, don't want more business, <laughs> except for maybe Andina. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, so how about this? I'll, uh, when uh, Margaret sends out my uh, PowerPoint to you, I'll put my phone number, all your closet questions or um, feedback, I welcome, so please send it. And I would ask you, before you leave today, you know, what is your next best step to contact restaurants. And maybe it's simply to go to that one restaurant that you haven't been to, but it's been on your mind. Just put it on your to-do list. It might be to go out and survey 10 restaurants and see where your opportunities are and make a game plan for the next 90 days. The, the one thing about restaurants that I think is the hardest lesson to learn is that it takes so long. It's like, it, I used to call it, it's like getting a bill through Congress. You know, you have to be patient at each one of the junctures and know that when it hits, you know, it's going to be great. But getting there can be very, very time consuming. And that's where, uh, honestly, a distributor can help because we're in there all the time. It can be helpful to have somebody that's on the street. Maybe you share someone with another winery to have somebody out there representing your wine. But I definitely think that on-premise builds brands. When people have a chance to sample it and have it with food and have it in a beautiful restaurant, that that can really help build your brand. So it's easy to forget about us because you can make the volume in retail, but restaurants are very important to build your brand. So make it a priority. All right, that's it. Thanks.